Welcome to the Law School Admissions Simplified Podcast, where we talk about all things LSAT, Law School Admissions, and otherwise. If you like what we do here, you can find everything I do at the uh, show notes, at my link tree. Um, I'm also on Instagram at LSA Simplified, as well as my website, lsasimplified.com. Um, so yeah, today I talked to Robert. Honestly, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Sani, Sani, not totally sure, but he's been around the LSAT space for quite a while. So we just talked about kind of all things LSAT. Um, I had an agenda and we honestly didn't get to everything. Kind of just because the conversation, you know, it takes a, its own flow. But I think we talk about the value of LSAT, you know, prep, as well as kind of things we see in the legal industry or not legal industry, but law school's pipeline to the legal industry that might be problematic. And then at the back end, if you want the spicy stuff, uh, we kind of talk about various disagreements and LSAT philosophy. Nothing huge. I don't think either of us are like gimmicks people. And it's more so, um, you know, he's more of a fan of scenarios and logic, logic games. Not that that really matters because all that's going away. So regardless of which of us is correct, um, either way, that's going away. And then additionally, he will make an argument for reading the question first. I've kind of already gone into my philosophy about why I think reading the argument is more useful, but I will let you, you know, hear both of our reasons out and then you can decide what makes more sense for you. So without further ado, we will cut over to Robert. All righty. Uh, Robert, for coming on. Uh, the first thing is, could you just tell me your LSAT backstory and your core beliefs about the test? Ooh. LSAT backstory. So I took, um, I started studying for the exam um, between my sophomore, junior years at Cal. Uh, this is 2012. And uh, I was a philosophy major. And it was uh, evident there were a lot of parallels there. Um, I was taking a lot of formal logic classes. They were kicking my ass. Uh, but it was nice to kind of transition that to the LSAT where, you know, usually it's if A, then B or C, as it's most complicated. Um, I took the October 2013 test. Um, I pushed my score. I pushed my test day back a little bit because I initially wanted to take the summer and I just felt like I was a little bit below where I wanted to be. Um, and I think that really paid off. Took the uh, took the October 2013 uh, I was PTing in the high 170s pretty consistently, like uh, in the 180 type range. And as per usual, uh, you know, score drops a little bit on test day. You know, various factors get in there. Uh, it could have been nerves, could have been a couple other things. But um, that in the way of core beliefs is something I would always push is make sure that you're kind of scoring three, four points above where you want to be uh, before before you really take. But I figured a 174 put me in a good spot. So I um, I did not retake applied i actually applied to um a whole slate of schools that senior year of college and then uh got into a, a bunch i liked um had some generous scholarships but i missed out on harvard and yale and i went to a couple uh scholarship meetings and would talk to folks um like for the michigan darrow or something and, and people were sneakily like i'm not really coming to this i'm gonna go to yeah i'm gonna go to stanford and i started to think to myself i didn't really have much instruction i was like maybe that is the right way to go about this. So I actually decided to work and uh, decided to work, started looking for a job. Um, and I had taken a blueprint course. I'd had a good experience with it. I had a great instructor named Phil Baru. Uh, this teaching oh, is going to interrupt us many times. Um, and he approached me before I took the test and said, if you score in the top 1%, we like you, we'll hire you. Um, so the test was good enough. So I started working for blueprint immediately after taking the test. And um, I worked for them for close to 10 years. And in the last year, I've struck out on my own, have some different, uh, I think, philosophical beliefs about how to most get the message across um, in a teaching environment. And uh, so I've started my own uh, little boutique called 170 plus in the last uh, 10 months. Nice. Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot there, which is really interesting. Yeah, I think, I mean, I was entering the LSAT space, um, I think one of the biggest ideas of like striking it on my own is one, the upside and that there's like, you can kind of build something bigger, but mm -hmm. also the LSAT, I mean, it's a very complicated test and people have different takes on it. Mm -hmm. And I found a lot of the companies, um, I mean, some of them have things which aren't necessarily bad, but like you might not agree with necessarily. Mm -hmm. Like I studied the score largely and mm -hmm. um, I used the Bibles when I studied, which there was some good stuff and some stuff that probably was suboptimal in terms of reading comp, especially. Um, Reading so, yeah. comp has been a mess, I feel like, in the last several yeah. years. Yeah. Well, also, just like a lot of the strategy, 
like it sounds bad, but like the biggest thing for reading comp is you have to read better, which isn't like super <laughs> typical, but it is ultimately like you'll get someone and they're like, oh, I found the tone. I'm like, right, but you didn't understand what you read. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Like you're still going to have a hard time. Um, so yeah, you did you say you went to law school? Did I catch that right? Or was that? Yeah, so worked. Um, I mentioned I was at Blueprint for 10 years. Worked there all through my time. Uh, first at a civil rights firm in San Francisco. Then went out to their New York offices. And so I applied to law school that following year, having missed out on, on Harvard and Yale. And I applied to just those two schools, figuring if they both said no, then the following year I would apply to a more broad slate. Uh, and Yale still said no. And yeah. Harvard said yes. So I went to uh, Harvard, uh, started in 2015, um, class of 2018. And uh, throughout my time there, I was doing a lot of bartending on the side, um, but right. a lot of LSAT instruction too. And previously, it was, it was really interesting, actually, because when I began for Blueprint in the Bay, this is like 2014, 20, uh, 2014, I was teaching exclusively classroom courses. So it was anywhere from like 25 to 40 students in a class. Um, and I loved that experience. I'd had a little bit of time with classroom courses. Um, and it's just, it's just so fun. I mean, it's, it's a fun experience yeah. to get in front of the whiteboard and teach a bunch of, of like eager faces. But ultimately, I think especially, you know, in a lot of settings, um, maybe especially on the LSAT, it's just from day one, there is someone on one end of the spectrum who does not understand how to take the contrapositive. And there is somebody else who is falling asleep with it. And I think from right. my very earliest experiences there, I think classroom courses, you know, have a role. It can drive down the price, make it more viable for students. But I think it is very limiting compared to individually tailored instruction. And when I went to New York, they just had li more limited classroom courses available. Um, and so I started getting more involved in direct tutoring, which is what I did all through law school. And I think that's what I've really built 170 plus on is. I've turned down a lot of opportunities to do even small class sizes. And if I were to ever do something, I'd really like to try to do it. Like people who have the same skill sets, have the same starting score, have the same target score. Because I think it just gets very difficult when people are all across the different spectrum. Yeah. And there's one even third that, who's bored, one third yeah. who's like falling behind and one third that you're catering to. Yeah. And even if you have them all coming in at the same point, I think at the same point, the rate at which people improve can be right. different. Someone might just start to get it the first time they see it. Mm -hmm. Whereas the one thing I see with the LSA is sometimes someone needs to see the same mistake like 10 times before it finally clicks. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I mean, I largely do a group model, but the whole idea is I do really short courses. They only run a month, um, mm -hmm. which is tough for marketing because I constantly have to be generating new people. Yeah. But as far as how I, often do they meet? It's, it's one month. Uh, we meet like twice a week for two hours. And I have a fair amount of on-demand stuff as well. Mm -hmm. But it's large, I mean, we're not teaching a whole lot in class. It's more just kind of doing questions for the most part, like actually mm -hmm. going through. Yeah. I'll usually let them kind of crash and burn on their own. And then we'll, you know, clean up them like ashes. Because I find that way. if I just do it, everyone's like, oh, I get it. Because it makes sense. But that's very different from a student really trying to do it without 100%. kind of hand-holding. Um, and some people, pretty quickly, you can realize like, they're kind of above the median of the class, but if you cater to those people, then everyone else gets left in the dust. So it does that's kind tough. of become an issue, um, even in small groups. Like even if you have five people, that's enough of a sample to have, you know, a variation. So it's tricky, but also I find um, it definitely does drive the cost down. Like I charge mm -hmm. only a few hundred bucks for a month and it's like 20 hours of live stuff. So like, mm -hmm. it's great for that. But the guide is also like, this is laying the kind of groundwork for self-studying because yeah, I don't think, a month of prep especially in its unfortunate nature of um i mean it kind of goes at the same speed regardless of who's there just because it kind of has to go at the speed it goes at right and you've got to hit that, these end objectives yep yeah and for some people that's too slow for others it's too fast um i mean i try to average like the average person coming in somewhere in the 140s like mm -hmm. kind of get it but also like they have a lot of ways to go um so yeah that's definitely the downside i, I find it to be expensive but it's definitely more optimal in terms of like mm -hmm. what you get for one hour of your time um so like if money's not a factor it's definitely the way to go i even want to throw this out like you remember uh first grade and the class gets divided mm -hmm. into like red group green group blue group and it's just sure. na named for colors because they don't want to be like offended but like slower kid, yeah. yeah exactly red group best group every time but um it, you never see that <sighs> For, for the LSAT, and I think that makes a lot of sense. I think for one thing, you know, 24-year-olds are a little harder to trick with colors. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that would make a ton of sense. If I was to try to consider something like that, um, it, like a group type of setting, I might try to do um, 
stratify it in that way what, what do you think would that be would that work you have a lot more experience with these group models than i do yeah i mean well, so, so the group models have a lot of value because up until you're scoring in the 170s like you have a lot to learn even people yeah. in the 150s still have i mean they're doing well compared to the average score of the test but as far as mm -hmm. understanding they're still making some pretty fundamental large mistakes right um however <laughs> if you're doing question two on logical reasoning that's just like the most obvious question ever and mm -hmm. you spent 10 minutes on it those people are definitely kind of like not using their time efficiently so yeah it would definitely be better to have it kind of like stratified into multiple groups it just becomes a logistical issue in yeah. terms of like, um how you even do that which is why it's like you know you meet for the hours but i tell everyone like most of the work you do has to be done outside because there's a whole homework schedule and on-demand stuff and mm -hmm. that people can do at their own pace um but yeah it's definitely it's a tough thing because like the optimal thing would be like you know talk to someone one-on-one -on -one, but it just becomes cost prohibitive for many people and I think that's one of the unfortunate things about the LSAT space. And that being said, I totally get it. As a tutor, like I, I charge a few hundred dollars an hour for my time. Like I don't want to right. do it, but it is prohibitive for a lot of folks. And it's kind of a tricky balance. Mm -hmm. No, it really is. I've gotten involved um, with a couple of like uh, low income or first generation groups at um, a couple of the UC schools as a UC sure. student myself. And, um, and I try to offer substantially discounted uh, rates there. Maybe if I were to look into this group model, that that would make sense because that would allow, you know, me to teach at a rate where they're paying maybe just like $100 an hour, but I'm taking four students at a time kind of thing. That right. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. And that's um like I always do fee waiver discounts for my courses because it's really right. easy there either way. So it doesn't cost me anything to have another person in class. Mm -hmm. And I found until you get to a pretty high point, it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, like if you have like 40 people in a Zoom meeting, it can get a little chaotic, but a lot of people are really shy over Zoom, which is probably one of the unfortunate things about online instruction versus in-person mm -hmm. is I'll have a month with someone and I will not know who they are at the end of the month because they have their camera off. They never talked. Oh, and do they have their camera off? Yeah, I let them because it's like, I think it would be better if they had their cameras on because it would be more interactive. But also I want people to be comfortable like doing whatever yeah. they want, like, they want to come observe. But then it becomes a thing where if you have your camera on, you're like one of three people with your camera on and you know mm -hmm. everyone's looking at you. So right. it's so much easier to like blend in. <laughs> Oh, but I do dork. think for the learning process, it's a lot easier to hide and like go online shopping or go on Twitter or just not be engaged. So it's tricky. Like, you, I, like I, I can still kind of sense who's engaged and who's not based on who's asking questions and all that stuff, but it's not certain. And it is one of those things where like, I'm sure you've seen this through your time doing all that, but like as an instructor, you can do your best to convey the ideas. If someone doesn't like work at it, nothing's going to happen. And mm. for the most part, people really, like, I don't really get people that blame. I have one person ever who like really blamed it on me. And I'm like, you didn't come to class. Like, what yeah, you like we're showing uh, up. Yeah. Well, so oh. I, I record everything. That's all on demand if they want yeah. it, um, which is great for people who oh, have oh, me. But I think it's also like kind of a double edged sword because then it gives you the chance to say, oh, I'll do it later. And then mm -hmm. they just never do it. So that's, um, I think, something that really like guides and in some ways probably limits like my teaching style, my business approach is like, I don't, I, I insist on the camera being on. If I, mm -hmm. if, if a student's eating, I don't, I don't really mind, but if a student's kind of, sorry, I'm going under the water. Oh, you're good. If a student's kind of like this and I can tell they're on their phone, I'm like, absolutely not. Which is delicate because they're paying, yeah. you know, they in theory are completely entitled to do whatever they'd like, but, um, I think maybe it comes from like my uh, short stint teaching college courses. And I was teaching at largely community colleges, a bunch of 18, 19 year olds, some of whom did not really want to be there. Um, and I felt like that was the only way to keep a class, you know, in line and engaged. Right. It, was, it was like someone's on the phone. I stop the lecture and I just stare until they get embarrassed and put their phone away kind of thing. And I think I bring that here. Um, I think it'd be tough for group settings. You make a, you, you make an interesting point, you know, that many like different little faces. So how do you, in terms of keeping them engaged, is it a lot of like, yeah. Uh, so, so John, what would you say the answer is here? Or like, what was the conclusion? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of do it. I, I've, I tried that one month where I would like cold call people, mm -hmm, cold call, to get yeah. them engaged and it just did not work where like some people right. like really respond others. It's like kind of the classic, like, I, I don't know. Um, Cause it's also a thing where you want people to be, maybe I'm like Gen Z all soft, but and like, you want people to be comfortable yeah. and like, right. I don't want to like put someone on the spot when they don't want to be there. Cause like, and like, maybe I should just run a pre-class poll. Just be like, are you comfortable being cold con on? If you're not, I won't do oh, that's it. That's a good idea. Cause that could be a way to like, I guess, keep the comfort, but also introduce that engagement mm -hmm. level. 
Yeah, maybe uh, even do something along the lines of like, what's your comfort level with it? And people right. who express like zeros and ones, like it's rare, but it could happen kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, That's so it's a tricky, it's a delicate balance because I definitely agree that when you're not forcibly engaging them, um, some folks just are naturally going to kind of drift off. I find many people that come to me, I mean, they paid for an LSAT class. But most of them care about being there and they want to get a higher mm -hmm. score. It's actually the undergrads that I find are the least engaged because I think many of them have their parents just pay for it because it's like you have to do something after school, sign up for an LSAT class, and a lot of them just like won't do anything. And the par the paralegals, they're doing it. They're showing up. Yes. Doing the but there is that kind of like, have you found that in your time as well? Or Absolutely. So many. And of course, it's like, it's impossible to generalize, but like yeah, oh, sure. small strains, you're absolutely right. I find, because uh, I think there's a good, no there's a good number of folks. Frankly, I will get like down thumbs for this take, but there's a good number of folks who head to law school or take the LSAT because they're like, I feel very smart, but my major is in a soft right. subject, English, poli sci. And I do not see immediate opportunities for me to be paid well, six figure type jobs off of my poli sci English history major. Um, and in many cases, they are very smart. And so law becomes an attractive way to go because, um, you know, having had a, brief legal career in a classic big law firm you really do just sit there and you do legal research and it's like with all the import of if you were like mixing test tubes and you paid very well um so it, it can work but i think there's a lot of folks who uh come to it because they're they don't see any other ways to exercise their degree i think there's also some folks i was joking with a client uh recently um where i I think there's a, a little bit of a motivation, like whatever you saw as a, as a child that really inspired you, you're like, I want to yeah. do that. And sometimes to an irrational degree, I've got a buddy who's a, like a firefighter and he's just like, his house uh, had like a small kitchen fire at one point, a bunch of like big, strong guys came in, saved the day. And he's a firefighter now in, in back in Orange County where I grew up. Very impressive. Great little career arc. Um, I think, you know, for me, I saw West Wing as a kid and I was like, this is inspirational. I just love the idea that politics is a bunch of really smart people have some really clever dialogue and then a, a solution is found kind of thing. And I think that's a big part of what motivated me to go to law school myself. Um, but I think in a lot of cases, folks see suits, you know, folks see something yeah. like suits or like, I don't know, if, uh, succession or something like that. And they see these lawyers, you know, doing their the big badass things, strutting into court and things like that. And there'll be moments in your legal career that feel like suits, but it's yeah. moments. And the vast majority of it is a lot of hard work. And I think that's analogous to the LSAT where it's like, you want that moment of like Mike or whatever from suits being like 180 every time and you can get there, but it's going to involve a lot of, you know, shooting in the gym late at night alone on the way. Yeah, I know. I think those are all really good points. Um, I, I had a pretty, I mean, I think you described where I was at pretty well in terms of why I decided to go to law school. I ultimately ended up not going. Um, I just decided. Did you enroll or apply or how far did it go? I got through the LSAT and like, you know, writing my personal statement, picking out schools, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I started doing like LSAT tutoring my senior year of college. At Boulder, right? Did yeah, yeah. So I went to the University Very of Colorado, cool. which is a fun story. I'm not exactly the Harvard of universities. I I uh, got asked by someone what I was doing post grad. I was like, oh, I think I want to do the LSAT thing. He's like, did you score above 150? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sort of above 150. That box was um, <laughs> Yeah. It, it's just, yeah. I don't know. It's like the, the standards are very low sometimes, um, which I think helped my GPA because just by showing up to my poli sci classes and like being present and like raising my hand once a class, mm -hmm. I was like considered a brown noser, um, which is kind of the bare minimum. I the think. gunner. Yeah, yeah, I was like the gunner for like showing up and when no one else would talk, I would talk. I would never raise my hand first, but it's like if the teacher's like grasping for something, I'll bail them out and be like, okay, I'll come in here. Yeah. Um, but that's just the University of Colorado. Lots of great students. Um, like in my poli sci classes, 40 kids, maybe five were like really smart people. And then there were a lot of kids that were there because their parents said, hey, go to college. And they're like, I'll go to Boulder. And, right. and have a blast is probably an amazing place to be after school, especially yeah. lately with the whole football craze. Yeah. But there's worse places to be. Um, yeah, I bet. And there are some really smart kids. It's just I think there's more of a range of like mm -hmm. people. Like I got a 4.0 my last three years. I started off poorly just because you know adjusting college, college. Um, and I was a dumb dumb because I was 18. But yeah, I, after like I figured it out, I maybe spent 10 hours a week doing homework, and I would get mm -hmm. 4.0 without really much effort. It was just easy. Um, and I was a STEM major too. It was just, even STEM was easy at Boulder. It's like, show up, yeah. homework, you're fine. Um, but yeah, so 
that's all really interesting stuff. I think there is a lot of, I mean, we'll kind of, I had this for later in the um, session, but do you find that a lot of pre-law folks have misperceptions about what the legal field is? You can probably speak to this more than I can, because I've never been a part of the legal field. I've just been observing it for a while. Um, but yeah, you were saying kind of the suits misperceptions or stuff like that. Yeah, I would say, so short answer, yes. I think there's a lot of mis misconceptions, <laughs> unfortunately. And I think, honestly, what it boils down to it largely is, um, it, it is sadly not the case that you can go to just whatever, you know, top 80th ranked school or hmm. i think there's i think there's 196 ABA. Oh, there's so schools. many and a lot of them it's there should there should be there should uh, literally this is something i think should be considered as like federal legislation to, to go oh, I, I totally agree on this i think it's way too easy to go into like some crappy school yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's really brutal yeah. it, I, it, it's really brutal and uh um there was a, an interesting um Obama's uh, Department of Education had an interesting push to really go after for-profit colleges and in some cases keep them on the hook for owing mm -hmm. things back to their students. That was maybe unsurprisingly canned in 2020. Biden's brought that back to an extent, but it's not as it's not been as robust. And uh, and it's mostly targeted colleges instead of law schools. And I think ultimately what it comes down to is um, in simple terms, there's probably three tiers of law schools. And the first tier is those top 50, where you do 50, maybe 60, where you, you have a chance at having a, a great paying job coming out of these schools. Yeah. And then I think when you're talking T60 to T120, th there's a chance perhaps, but I, I think the odds are against you of having oh, a good sure. job. The odds yeah. might be against you of ever being able to repay your loans, literally speaking. And then there is that yeah. bottom third, the you know, T20 to T196, that is almost never going to be a viable investment. And I think- that needs to be so much more clear to students. So I would say because two thirds of students roughly end up down there at, at those bottom two thirds of schools, um, that I think alone creates such a misperception because in a lot of cases, those are never going to turn into the the type of jobs that you envision for yourself. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah, I get a lot really of hate because I, I say don't pay for basically schools outside of like, I, I go even further, like outside like the top 30-ish or so, like just don't pay tuition because mm -hmm. it's like you minimize your risk. Obviously you have your time or if you go to like, well, I'm in De uh, Colorado, so the University of Denver, it's like 90th or something. And I mm -hmm. think if you are maybe valedictorian, you might have a big firm like iron, like interviewing you or I don't know where the cutoff is, but I know it's not like the top 30%. It's way stricter than that. Yeah. Or if you want to be like a public defender or like work at the DA's office, I don't know how hard it is. I think that can happen. But mm -hmm. so many people actually picture themselves being a public defender when they're going to law school. They want to be Harvey Specter mm -hmm. and like doing stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I have a pretty limited understanding. My is very um, from the outside looking in, just kind of like looking at the numbers. But the numbers paint a very bleak picture in terms of what the legal field is for the average grad. And there is definitely that misperception of if I just get into law school, it'll all work out. And with yes. the death people are looking at, it's like, um, it could work out, but mm -hmm. the odds don't look good. It's like, you could study for or try to be like an NFL player your whole life and just completely neglect every other aspect of yourself. And it might work mm -hmm. out, but it's like in all likelihood, you're just going to end up as a 25 year old kind of burnt out with no skills. And there's the survivorship bias. If you only really oh, hear the sure. of where it does, it's just so tough. Cause I, I hear all the time, like, oh, well, like, I had a buddy who went to Southwestern he works at a big firm and it's like, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. if, if he wasn't at a big firm, he wouldn't yeah. have met him to hear this story. You can meet a lot of Southwestern grads who are not at big firms. I, I think another thing that needs to be, explicit and and communicated more effectively to all students is there is a business model for these predatory law schools because oh. it is it, it is just wild the federal government will front the hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of tuition money that the student needs to cover their tuition and all the school has to do is get the student to sign up for that and then years later these three hundred thousand dollars accruing interest at a rate of seven percent a year yeah seven percent all on the, are all on the student you just need some quixotic 22 year old with promises of like oh we'll take you i don't know why those other schools don't want you we'll take you even with your 3.5 and your 145 lsat just sign up oh, i know you don't have the tuition money right now that's fine there's federal loans that'll get it and the schools get that dished out to them and then i think a lot of students i mean yeah i mean i'd be interested i i really think that this has been uh underreported a little bit here they're, oh they're for awesome. sure when i start telling like people in my life about this like i'll have like an uncle who's like interested no one knows about kind of the law school grift that happens where yes there's so many 
that are, and I think it started happening pretty early because like even the University of Colorado, they're one of those T50 schools. And most people, or at least many people will do okay out of mm -hmm. graduation. But there's mm -hmm. also a lot of people that are going to go like 150K into debt. And there's also the whole like scholarship system where the yeah. most likely people to succeed with high LSATs and high GPAs aren't paying. And the most mm -hmm. likely to fail are the ones ending up in debt. So it's like a whole take from the rich. And you're familiar with these conditional scholarships. Oh, yeah. Uh, related to this too. It's, uh, you know, it's folks saying every semester your conditional scholarship will be reevaluated fully with the expectation that you're going to end up getting your first year a 50% scholarship, but then you'll fail the GPA requirement and you'll lose, you mm -hmm. will not fulfill the conditions of your scholarship and you'll have to keep paying, but you're already $30,000 in debt. I'm sure that to some listeners, this might sound cynical and I'm certainly oh, I think we're just articulating uh yeah, I'm articulating the cynical side. I could say, you know, that talk about some of like the lovely stories of someone who went to a lower ranked law school and had an amazing career. And I'm sure that that has happened. Yeah, it but, has. it's not like this is what you're up against. Yeah, it is. It, it is pretty conniving. Schools are aware of what they are doing. And I think it needs to be I think it needs to be understood by students signing up. And I think there needs to be some kind of push at the federal level to, to minimize these. The, the oh, number of law sure. schools should yeah. be reduced by at least one third. Yeah. I, oh, I totally agree. Well, and I always tell Canadian folks that they have a better system because I don't think they have like the truly, mm -hmm. elite. they mm -hmm. don't have the Harvards, the Yales, like mm -hmm. Toronto, it's a good school, but like McGill. it's probably hard with like Northwestern or like Michigan. Like it's, it's good, but it's not, right. um, but I also tell you guys don't have the bottom feeders. Like they're mm -hmm. like, you guys have some worse law schools. Don't get me wrong, but they're not like the level of um, what's the one St. Mary's I think in Texas, which is like barely even around their yeah. schools, like, 145 medians. It's like, what are we talking about? These are people that, um, like, I, I'm not trying to be elitist and say, but like, if you are at a 145, it means you have work to do and you shouldn't be going to law school yet. doesn't mean you can't yeah. get, but at, in your current state, you're not ready. You're going to get mm -hmm. eaten up by this competition. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah. And then their tuition, they don't do the whole scholarship nonsense where they, um, dish out money for high LSATs and high GPAs to raise their ranking and then make the, um, lower numbers pay everything. So I, I don't know. It's like, I think if our system looked a lot more like Canada, it would be a better overall thing, but you know, all these hungry people that are unsatisfied with careers or um, undergrads that don't know what to do, as long as they can keep getting into law schools and kind of like selling themselves the dream, um, yeah. the system can change. So, yeah, I don't I know. I think that's a, a big factor, too, is the dream is so powerful because yeah. at the at the highest levels, um, you know, you are doing Thurgood Marshall work. You are doing Clarence Darrow type of work. You are doing mm -hmm. Obergefell type of work. Like it, it just some really beautiful things come out of the Supreme Court every now and again, not all the time. Um, but, uh, it's so, it's so inspiring. And I think people, yeah. um, just, you know, law schools understandably want to kind of raise the market to meet the demand. And that is exactly why we have, you know, the Leviathan is to, when we recognize an, an improper market is being constructed, maybe to right, yeah. that market a little bit. So there, I think, um, you hit on something too, a slight pivot here which is when we start talking about those 145s. I, so I don't really know how valuable the LSAT is, uh, sure. in my estimation, as a predictor of law school success with one exception. And it is that I do think folks who struggle to hit something in a 155 type of range, you may be susceptible to getting tricked in some ways that will challenge you in your legal career. If you are struggling with a 155, you know, reading comprehension tests like are you easily tricked with long passages, dense, unfamiliar information? Can you sort through it in an organized way where you come out understanding it well? It's a lot of what you're doing in law. Right. Logic games, which, you know, RIP, but logic games test like how good are you with spatial reasoning with like quick deductions? How well can you map out case strategy, for example, for like how different settlement periods might align and understand different scenarios around if you go different courses of action? Logical reasoning. It's probably the closest to arguing, you know, can you identify, can you identify the flaw and thus weaken your opponent's argument? Can you identify the flaw in your own side's argument and thus strengthen your client's argument? And I do think for individuals who have a, a hard time reaching that uh, at least 155-ish threshold, that really is an indication that on at least one or probably multiple of these levels, you, you will have a hard time in the legal field getting tricked uh, by opposing counsel is what it yeah. largely boils down to, I think. Uh, we had talked about saving a little room for hot takes. That might be, that might be one of mine. No, I, I say that from time to time. And um, I think I do a help. So I'm mostly on Instagram is where I market and I have about 9,600 followers ish, give or take. Oh, wow. 
And yeah. about once every six months, I post something that gets me like kind of semi canceled. Um, and my last one was, <laughs> it was a meme of this guy applying and it said, it was like some guy posting on like social media. It was like a thirst trap, like who want me? And then the poll result was a hundred. I'll just show you. It's like, do you want me? And it, everyone says no. And I put a path <laughs> of flying with a 145. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like no. Yeah. Other. Um, I, everyone uh, was so mad. And, you, and the type of person who's, who's upset about that is probably someone. They were never that, like, like trying range. to get a higher LSAT. Cause like, I, yeah. I don't know. I think people see through it, but like I, I enjoy doing Instagram and like podcasts and stuff. But mm -hmm. ultimately the idea is to get eyeballs because like this is my full time yes. job. And if people don't sign up for things, I don't pay rent. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> doesn't mean I can't provide good free content. And if you just want to consume free content, all cool. But like right. ultimately, if no one, if eventually people stop paying for stuff, I go bye bye pretty quickly because you right. know <laughs> I, I have to pay the bills somehow. Um of I used course. to be really shy about that. Like I used to feel bad about selling, but it's like I think it's I provide part of it. Yeah, it's like, and also like we're providing a service. If people don't want it, that's cool. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have to, but yeah. People... I think that has been a really rewarding part of my last yeah. year or so. Um, getting this off the ground is is uh, figuring out um, figuring out the taxes, which was not as fun. Per se, that's not which fun. was yeah, which was interesting. All. Yeah, it, I mean, I learned a lot and um, figuring out the best way to market. Honestly, I spent a lot of time like picking a name. I was like, I was like, I don't want to pick a name, associate the email with it, name the LLC this, and then like decide I don't I like the name. Yeah, so, I actually yeah. that. Um, and it's not a fun process. So completely revamp a website and yeah, like it's a headache. But and I still don't love my name. It's a largely LSAC rules that I have it the way it is. But um, I don't know if I can say. Oh, that. did they yeah. send like any kind of like a cease and desist kind of thing or no? Um, they. Like, did they reach uh, out? It's weird. So that technically you're not supposed to use the word LSAT in domains um, mm. according to their rules, but also I reached out to them up front. So I think it's only like, I don't think they actually own LSAT to that level. I think it's if I had a prior contract with them, which I did prior to making the domain, then it's a problem. Yeah. Um, they also said I could keep it. They would just want to really audit my site periodically to make sure everything was like in line with what they were messaging, which I think right. it is. It's like, I'm, I'm not saying anything wild. Um, because obviously there's a ton of LSAT sites out there um that have LSAT in the name. Like I think well, actually I don't know if Blueprint has it like in their domain. Um I know LSAT Max does. Oh no, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, um LSAT, LSAT obviously. Right. Kevin Sage neglected it, which I think may have been um intentional. They have a lot of nitpicky things. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm not gonna go into that. Um because like it's I don't want all wanna... the litigious fields. Yeah, there's well it's so they're cool. institutional lawyers. And also, honestly, I don't think they ever would have done anything if I didn't change it. I don't think they're like really looking out for it, but they could. And I'm just trying to like always follow their rules, even if um, technically or not technically, but realistically, they wouldn't do anything. So like, I just don't want to um, cross LSAC because for the most part, they're pretty like they're really nice people whenever I interact with them. Yeah. They're just um, I just don't see a reason to like push them mm -hmm. um, because, you know, they probably could drop the hammer down if they ever wanted to. And my livelihood relies on this. So it's just yeah. not something no, I'm think, I think uh, they haven't done anything to me. So I'm happy with them as they are. So if LSAC, you're listening, we're cool. I'm not mad. We love you. We yeah. love you, LSAC. You guys do a lot of good stuff for us. I'm Big fan. Fresh stuff, but I, I, yeah, um, we won't go through that. Um, so yeah. Uh, so yeah, you put a decent amount of thought into it. Um, we'll plug all that stuff. I mean, I guess you could say it now. I'll put it at the end of the episode and in the show notes as well. Um, but like, where can people find you if they want to... Um, like do tutoring or anything? Um, I would say reach out uh, to my email at robert at 170 plus LSAT. Now I got to worry about this. 170 plus LSAT.com. Robert at 170 plus LSAT.com. Um, or go to the website at uh, 170 plus LSAT.com. Cool. Yeah. And I will link that so people don't have to write it down or anything um, just to keep it simple. Much obliged. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm always, I'm kind of a believer of a, like there's so many LSAT takers and if, if someone like clicks with you better or clicks with one of the other people I've had on, I think, um, you know, ultimately that's okay. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of negative interactions in the LSAT space with other people, which is unfortunate because I don't think it's a zero. Sum. Well, I mean, it is kind of a zero sum game. There are a finite number of LSAT takers, mm -hmm. but there's like what a hundred thousand a year and to support right. my business, I need 300. Like right. I'm fine. <laughs> it's, it's such a minority to like do well right. to where, you know, I just want collegial, I'm not going to go. I'll, I'll tell you who I've had nasty interactions with after we get off. Yeah, I might need that in a side chat. Yeah, I'm curious. Yeah, um, but yeah, I've, I guess seen, I've seen some funny. I've seen some funny behavior, and uh, 
this is not any kind of um this is uh 14 years ago i think but you probably <laughs> recall the uh, the blueprint test maxwell's litigation if, if there was a time when someone was claiming a certain score, was that a different one? Because oh, I'm, so you know, I'm only 24 for reference. So like I'm, yeah. I mean, I've been paying attention since I was like 19, but still pretty new to the whole. That's that's very fair because you probably were not 10 years old looking up like Robin Singh. Like what did he do? Yes. So I think there were all kinds of. Um, it, it it was at a time. Oh of, yeah yeah you know I, I do know about this. Um, if if you this, googled deposition yeah. on on YouTube for a while, I'm not sure if this is still the case, but for a long while, if you Google deposition on YouTube, like the second hit, the first is Little Wayne High, the second hit was. Um, was the uh, blueprint test master deposition and it was just very antagonistic it was very aggressive uh it was um, a gentleman named trent uh being deposed who done a lot for me he was he was great but one of the founders of blueprint and i think largely they split off from from test masters and you know it's uh like we discussed it's a litigious industry oh, wow. it's prideful yeah, it's fascinating it's really fun I, I was just looking it up i'll have to watch this later because it says mm. lawyer goes off the deep end is the uh, yes. title of the video so wigs out wigs out it's fascinating folks. Yeah. Dig in. No, it's a, it's a, it's a funny little juicy industry and it's uh, a lot of it is pretty small. You know, most of the folks from power score and LSAT max and blueprint and test masters are all kind of like splitting off doing um, various own things. Uh, and it's, it's been, it's been fun to see. And in a lot of ways it's healthy because you want that kind of market competitiveness. Uh, yeah. No, it's good. And again, you, you get that product too. Yeah. yeah um, and it is interesting. You kind of get these little niches because like I'm on Instagram and there's the other Instagram guys, and we're like the big mm -hmm. people on Instagram, but in the whole LSAT yeah. world, we're relatively small. And it's mm -hmm. like you're like the Instagram guys. There's three of us. Um, I should I be have, doing that. I, I, I should try. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a basic. Um, I can give you like a basic idea of like things I've done because I've it's a lot of it's trial and error when you're doing this yourself. Mm -hmm. Like some things I have had so many things I'm like, this is awesome. This is going to crush it. I put it out there. No one cares at all. It just like dies. That'll and, crush me. I'll be bummed the first time that happens, frankly. Yeah, it happens. Well, so the other thing is you just have to fail fast is what I found. Like I did yeah. um, a lot of things that, and, and some things you do like on a whim thinking they'll just like be a small thing and then they become like a core part of your business model. Mm -hmm. And you're like, wow, this works really well. Um, I've been exploring Reddit pretty much exclusively. Yeah, I, and I, I've, I've had, had some Reddit for a while and I don't know, Reddit's so negative and they really hate commercial offerings. Mm -hmm. There's like some like hate and like, I, I try to be a really positive person. I'm just like posting advice. But then the instant you even mention, and if you want, you can check out like my book here. It's nine ninety nine on Amazon. Everyone's like, screw this guy trying to make money off us. I'm like, it's yeah. just a, like, you don't have to buy <laughs> it. It's, I think it's value. Like I really put a lot of time and effort into making it like hopefully a good process. If you don't like the book, that's fine. Like there's reasonable minds can disagree, but like you guys are just mad that I'm selling a $10 book. Like, well, I wonder what these people do when they like are going down the street and they walk past the taco stand. They're like, these assholes trying to make money off us. <laughs> yeah. struck by, why well, would you be mad? That's a weird disconnect. Cause like, I mean, two things can be true at once. Like, I want to help people. I also have to pay the bills. And mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Like, I think when people pay me, they get disproportionate value for what they're paying. If someone mm -hmm. pays me 500 bucks, but their LSAT score goes up 15 points, we both win. Like, that's a mutual and victory. We could, but, we could play that out. We, the yeah. differential cost. Oh, spending, spending an extra. I, I, I will, I will stab. Way higher than 500. Uh, spending an extra $10,000. Mm-hmm. To get two points that you couldn't have got without that ten thousand dollars is immensely worthwhile, and it will pay off within your first year or two of law school. There is an argument yeah. to be made that paying one hundred thousand dollars for two points that you could not get elsewhere is a fantastic investment. Well, yeah, because then there's all your career trajectory, like what school That's you go to. Well, absolutely, yeah. um, without a doubt. And and if if anybody watching is not familiar, um, you know, I could make my complaints about like the the big law experience. Um, yeah, I, I overall had a pretty pretty nice time. They work you very hard, but the salary is dumb. If you don't have a better plan for making a quarter of a million dollars a year when you're you know twenty five years old, twenty six years old, laws and options. You know, it's uh, it, the the salary is wild. It is the same at every single one of these top one hundred firms. It's two hundred forty thousand dollars a year to start with like a forty thousand dollar bonus, and then like twenty thousand dollar raises every year after. It's absurd. They pay you very well. They work you very hard. Pay you very well. So if you can do anything to that, will give you better odds of getting into one of these top tier jobs instead of a job that's paying instead of 240, 140, well worthwhile. Else yeah, that can be one of the best investments all time. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it is funny because you see people being like penny wise and pound foolish with, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. not that you have to spend thousands of dollars on the LSAT. You can, and I think it can make sense in a lot of, um, 
situations, but there's also people where it's like, I have a free ebook and then I have my paid book. And I had an email exchange with someone today who was mad that the paid book is not what gets sent out for free. And I'm like, dude, mm -hmm. I have actual LSAT questions in here. I have to pay royalties to LSAT. Oh for yeah. Um, it's not a lot, but like if I was sending every one of those out for free, it would add up really mm -hmm. quick. Cause yeah. the amount I distribute for free is like hundreds a month. And it's like, mm -hmm. even if it's only a dollar, my marketing budget is now 2000 just to put out a free book. Like, right. no, thank you. Um, like I could use that money in much better ways. And so it's like, if you want the book, like it's $10 on Amazon, like you can go get it. It's not hard. Um, it's probably pirated on your In fact, I know it is. Um, <laughs> no, no, you pirate it. um yeah. if you need it that bad, email me, we'll talk, but, uh, but also it's like $10. Like don't go to the trouble of that. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's a uh, pretty fascinating stuff. Um, I did, I was just curious. So you've been around the LSAT for, um, it sounds like you said 2012 is when you started studying. So a good while. Um, oh, how do you feel about logic games going away? Like, is that, it, I mean, I've only um, been around, that was a shock to me. So, so I mean, first off, I, uh, I think most viewers are probably aware that uh, the LSAC was removed, uh, or sorry, logic games were removed as a result of, uh, a lawsuit from a, a, a blind student probably making the it seems very intuitive point that it is harder for me to uh visualize the games right. than other students and it puts me at a competitive disadvantage um so you know i'm very i'm very receptive to that argument i don't know that removing games is necessarily the best solution one immediately available solution and i had multiple friends at harvard actually who were blind and i don't know what they scored it's plausible to me that what they scored is like a 164 where they missed a lot of games questions, but they explained in an LSAT addendum or maybe in a diversity or personal statement as well, but explained in an LSAT addendum that situation. And I think that would be very compelling. I think a lot of admission staffs would be very responsive to an LSAT addendum that explained, well, I did poorly on the game section. I always have because I am blind and I cannot see the games. Of course. Uh, yeah. I think we can all imagine how difficult it would be. Um, I think another solution that's not immediately available, but that they could have, you know, a, a smaller change, maybe a better change is to like have an alternative section for students with visual impairments is probably an option. Then you get into the difficulty of people's tests not being identical. I think that still might be a good, have been something worth considering. What I would say about what's interesting about games being removed is I don't think we are quite prepared for how the discourse and the general understanding of the test will change. Because currently we think of the test as like, oh, it does three different things. It tests your reading comp, these long passages. It tests your LR, these riddles. And it tests these games, these like massive word problems. We are going to start talking about the test as the LSAT is a test of riddles. Oh, also there's a reading comp section. I think that it's going to change substantially with the removal of games. Now that we're down to a three section test with only one experimental section. So it puts a lot of weight on, on logical reason. I mean, it becomes obviously two thirds of the exam. And I just, I, I always want, we talk politely about the LSAC. I think I'll call him out here. The LSAC said, we have a perfectly tailored test that is the best out there for reducing how yeah. well you will perform in law school. It's it, and it has to be this, because this is how we came up with it. It's two LR sections, 50% of the test. 27 RC questions, 27% of the tests, and 23 LG questions, 23% of the test. And then COVID hit. Yeah, they completely. And they got rid of one of the LR sections. And now COVID's gone, and they don't have that problem anymore, or relatively gone, and we don't have that problem anymore. And we're like, LSAC, we should switch right back to the formula that you came up with that perfectly reduces people's skills. And they're like, it's fine. It's whatever. Can you imagine? It's like someone's like, I've got the perfect barbecue sauce recipe. It's this much of this ingredient, this much of that ingredient, this much of that ingredient. And then we're missing ingredient number three and the perfect barbecue sauce recipe is like, it's fine. It's the same shit. I don't, it doesn't matter. I just think that's odd. I, I think like- No, it definitely is weird. Big emperor is wearing no clothes moment, I think. Well, and they're always talking about why scores went up, which scores have gone up substantially since it's gone online. Um, I think a lot of that, I mean, earlier you talked about the score drop. I think part of it is now when you can take it from home, you're in a comfortable environment, you don't have to commute, and that can help alleviate some of that mm -hmm. drop. Um, additionally, I think having logic games now be like almost a third of your score instead of, mm -hmm. like you were saying, less than a quarter. Right. I, I think it's the easiest section to perfect where like many people I work with, in fact, like I think most people that get at least the 160s or higher have perfect games. I mean, I'll have someone yes. in class for a month and they'll be like, games is so easy. And this is not someone who's like 
super crushing it on other sections, yes. but they're just like, this is easy. Like I can do this all day. But they never talk about that when they talk about the score increases and kind yes. of like the COVID bubble. We're like, now right. they just it. 99th percentile is a 176 now, yeah. which like used to be, I think when I took it, it was a 172 yes. um, or something. It's just, I think that's right. So massive inflation. I think part of that is probably there's just like, if you want to pay for substantial LSAT <laughs> prep, I, I, my, my belief, honestly, is if you are baseline intelligence and you are willing to throw a th th several thousand dollars at the problem, you, everyone will get a 170. Everyone with baseline intelligence who is willing to take the test more than once, great tutors, everyone lands a 170. I've, I've legitimately never seen it not happen. And I would say for almost all students, if, if you're willing to take the test multiple times and you're willing to work hard, 165 available to nearly everybody. And this is one thing I do think is nice about removing games is like you said, I think games is as much a reflection of at some point in your LSAT studying career, did you have $3,000 to spare on making sure that you had perfect games? The people who crushed games studied well, and some of them didn't use test prep. Maybe some of them used power score books and things like that, or just right. use seven stage and things. But I think the people who aren't able to crush games, it shows you weren't able to pay for test prep because I think yeah, you didn't get a good, for test if prep. you got the resources, you would have gotten Exactly, them. exactly. So sure I think that. that is a nice thing about removing games. I think that was becoming so socially, socioeconomically stratified that uh, it's so learnable that it kind of reflects like, did you, were you able to pay to learn it? And I think that is actually a really nice element of removing games is that now the rest of the test is, is harder to learn and it's not so much a, like, you know, I, I, I drilled all the games, worked with the tutor and took the test multiple times and thus, you know, I got my high score. So I think yeah. that's one nice twist. Yeah, I'm, I'm sad just because like a part of me likes games. Um, also, mm -hmm. I spent all- And we've both, yes. Yeah. We like, probably I, worked a lot <laughs> on it, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many hours I put in a game. All of 2023, I recorded basically every logic game in existence. Yeah. Made a giant logic game course, which is still out. Like I got some money off of it. <laughs> Nowhere near what I thought I was going to get, um, depending on, I wouldn't have done it if I knew game yes, you know, yes. I knew it was going away. I just didn't believe LSAC was doing it anytime soon because mm -hmm. generally they tend to be pretty slow to do things. Right. Um, so yeah, it's a, a fun, I don't know. Like part of me, it's like dinosaur games fun. Like seeing that one inference about what dinosaur has to be. I don't remember Mob. what it is. Yeah. Mob, it's like right? one of the, it's like what the Stegosaur or Tyrant. I, I don't know. There's one inference that makes the game just totally unlocked if you see yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And um, the first time I did it, I was a studier and it, like I scored a 165 on that test, which freaked me out because that was like well below my average because I just got crushed by that game. Mm -hmm. um, but in hindsight, it's like, no, this is learnable. This really isn't that hard. You just have to see it. Mm -hmm. And seeing that like light bulb go off in games, especially, is just so cool to see with people. Yeah. Um, I also think it does make improving harder because LR and RC, they are very learnable. Um, I think we probably both agree that they're very perfectible if you kind of learn the game that's being played. But like mm -hmm. games is the chance where people see, oh, I can master this in like a month. And now they're yes. like the other things. Yeah. Whereas LR and RC, very learnable, but RC can take a while if someone's just a bad reader to start to like retrain their muscles, like actually pay attention to what they're reading. That can take a few months of like yelling at them, be like, did you actually understand that sentence or are you just moving on? And so mm -hmm. often they can't tell you what they just read. So yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, I think so. Yeah, I'll be sad to see them go for sure. I do think here's another interesting element. Uh, you know, I was talking about the, um, the barbecue sauce problem. Yeah, you know, you're removing one of three ingredients, and apparently it's and apparently it's fine. Um, I, I do think an interesting thing relating to that mob dinosaur score is when else when the games are worth twenty three percent of the test. If you botch a game, it's it's a big problem. When the games are worth thirty one or thirty two percent of the test, when you right. botch a game, it's a huge problem. And I've actually, I think that that's an interesting thing too. Is like now that we have a um, 75 question test instead of a hundred question test. I think the variance that gets introduced by oh, like, I, I just struggled with one game is just so much potential to take someone scoring in the like mid one seventies and send them down to the high one sixties and stuff. That is one thing I've, I've noticed. I don't particularly like, especially currently while the LSAC is, and, and these trends are pretty subtle, but while they seem to be trending towards some more like odd games, like I think of like the the uh, trading buildings game, uh, PTA yeah. game four, I think. It's right? a pretty easy it's, one if you figure it out. Um, exactly. But Once you notice odd. to just like call it $1, $2, $4, easiest game on the entire test. But if you notice to call it $1, $2, $4 for the relative value of the different classes of buildings, 
you blow through it and the rest of the game takes three minutes and that rewards someone who happens to stumble onto that game. The other individual who's like maybe very well studied and, and yeah, they know linear didn't groovy, have hybrid. To, yeah. Right. It doesn't, and, help you. it doesn't help at all. And you might lose all those points. And I just think there should, that is part of what should be reflected, but I think it's a little bit outsized when we make games, one of the three sections. So mm-hmm. I think that maybe is another element that I appreciate about seeing it gone because some of that still exists in RC. Oh yeah, but it, does, but it does not exist obviously in LR. And I think I think the test was becoming there was too much variance introduced when they. Oh yeah, crap test like the dinosaur game. Say what you will about it being learnable. The first time you see it for many people, oh, it does goodness. completely throw you off. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also the workshop game where yeah, um, that was that, probably my favorite. Time. I just taught that in class like a week ago, mm-hmm. and there's one inference where I think it's M has to give it to J every single yeah. day, and if you see that, it's just unlocked. Yeah. But for the average LSAT taker who just throws down a diagram, you can't, it's not an easy one to diagram. Like you don't even yeah. know where to start. So, mm-hmm. um, but I, I, yeah. So the way I, the way I teach yeah. that, by the way, for the, for the workpiece game, I'd be curious your thoughts. Cause I've never liked the name I've used for this. Um, I just call this concept, um, rule of twos. Two being that if it's not a, oh, that's great. It has to be B. Cause there's only two options. Rule of threes would be if it's not a, oh, it's just down to B slash C. So on games, we'll put B slash C into one of the slots. So this is a funny conversation because games will go away and this won't really. Yeah, happen. this is not going to be good content. Sad, yeah. Um, but yeah. but uh, for the workpiece game, there's only four options. The M can't transfer to the K, M can't transfer to the L. So, oh, it can't transfer to itself. It must transfer to the J. I yeah. have found that so many games get unlocked simply by that, especially when there's only four, maybe five players. And oh, you definitely. The process yeah. of elimination. It's like the simplest thing. And I've just never found a name that I quite like. It's almost like the law of small numbers kind of thing. Yeah. The way I do it is I always have people um, make their diagram, do the rules, and I have a whole like order of operations to really dumb it down for people, mm-hmm. um, which is like, does rule two combine with rule one? Mm-hmm. Cool. Does rule three combine with rule two? Does that combine with rule one? Just like right. pretty straightforward. After they've done that, I, I like to say pause and ask yourself, is there anything that just like kind of controls the whole game, yeah. whether it be a slot, a variable? Um, mm-hmm. Or just a connection, like M has to give to J no matter what. And right. if you can find that, I think it's on like most games. Mm-hmm. Um, you basically unlock the whole thing. However, I find many people, they get their diagram, they're so worried about rushing, they go straight into the questions and now they're doing all this oh. extra work where if they just like pause for 30 seconds to make, to find, and make, finding inferences does not take very long. Like it takes right. just asking yourself, do these rules interact? If they do, you have an inference. If they don't, that's cool. A lot of them won't move on. But like I've looked Are back, you big on scenarios within that too? I don't really do scenarios. Um, what I do is get that base diagram and then um, on global, well, I, I call them global. It's not real. Mm-hmm. It's just like my terminology. A question mm-hmm. that asks about the whole game, such as like what could be true or what must be true. Right. You've already done your work through the inferences. You'll already have the answer. Maybe you'll have to test one, probably not. Usually you just get to your answer. Mm-hmm. And then on um, local question, mm-hmm. which is like where they give you information, such as like if X is third, then you put X third, you ask, what do I know about the third slot? What do I know about X? And you kind of add all those inferences on. And then once you've lost traction, then you look to the answers and you've usually got to the answer just through that. Yeah. So I'm maybe testing out two to three answers per section. Um, but I, I think it's kind of a hybrid between um, the scenarios or worlds or whatever people call it versus, because you're doing the same work, you're just doing it in a different order. You're doing it with test um, directly calls for it rather than upfront. Yeah, and that makes sense. Worlds definitely, there are games where worlds or scenarios, if there are three options and you can just see that, like game over, you set it up up front, you're done. I find it to be confusing to a lot of people. Um, that being said, it's one of those things where I think reasonable minds can disagree because I've also had people that come to me and they've perfected it using scenarios. I'm like, don't change it. Like if it's yeah. working, don't do it my way because you're getting the points and that's all I care about. The way you get there, right. it's another thing with diagramming where people will be like, how do you diagram this rule? I'm like, well, I'll show you how I diagram it, but you can diagram it however you want to, because I don't care what's right. I just care that you get the proper information out of it. Right. And I have some, I think, nuances in how I diagram things that might not be intuitive. And that's okay, because like it doesn't have to be. You don't have to copy my work. You just have to copy my thought process. Right. So. The, um, the, the thing with di- Or. Say again, say. Are you more of a scenarios person when you're doing them? Or how do you do I lean pretty heavy that way, yeah. Yeah. Um, I find, like, I would tell my clients that there are, there are like one, two, three games in the history of the test. I wouldn't recommend some of those for. Um, if we're talking ordering games, obviously the block is in, <laughs> is an easy instance. Um, and if not the block, is there a highly restricted player? Oh, the V can only go third or fourth or fifth. Okay, I'll do three scenarios based on where the V goes. Um, 
And if not a certain player, maybe a certain slot. Oh, only these three players are able to go first. Everybody else has to go later. So I'll do a scenario for each of these. And then my hope is that in the vast majority of cases, we, you build that front-loaded work. Um, I tell my clients every question is either a 5, a 10, or a 15-second question. If you've got those scenarios, oh, yeah, this I one should be that. 5, this one should be 10, this one should be 15. Um you know, if it's tough, should be 15. I think something that gets really underrated, though, and I think you make a good point, is is that these can get confusing because I find so often instruction around scenarios involves how to build them. Yeah, exactly. Because they're, they're not how to use them. Like if they're using a floater and putting a floater in all eight spots, it's like that's right. not useful. Yes. It's not useful. Exactly. Good. Yeah. I analogize it to like uh, there's on the one hand, we're we're building a fishing pole, which we need to get good at. And then on the other right. hand, we are like learning fly fishing. And these are two separate skills and you need both in order to make maximum use of your scenarios. Um, yeah. Yeah. Games, man. I'll be sad to see it go. I, I think yeah, it's a bummer. Like all this, everyone finds it's, fun. It's interesting for us LSAT nerds, but like, this is going to part of what I do is I try to make like kind of content that's evergreen that you can recycle. Um, you're up here. You don't want to get too careful, but like every year I repost my best Instagram post because in the LSAT space, your audience turns over pretty quickly. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So it's like by the next year, um, seen it. Post, no one remembers. So yes. obviously if you did a month on month, people would get really sick of it, but mm -hmm. I take my like five best posts from a month and I can just recycle them. Um, and I just have a folder on my um, desktop. That's like recycled Instagram content. And it has each month. So like yeah. I scheduled April's um, cause I schedule in advance, which is for me, a quality of life thing. I hate posting every day. It's so annoying. I do it mm -hmm. once a month and I forget about it. And yeah. it just like, does it for me every day. I'm surprised by what I post occasionally oh, it automatically comes up oh that's very clever i see yeah it's yeah well and i've been working on getting on tiktok and tiktok doesn't want to do that for me and i'm really pissed off because i i like working it's not that i'm but i hate having to do something at any given moment mm -hmm. like i used to do consultations i don't anymore just because it used to break up my day so much and also i find with a free consultation unfortunately you get some very legitimately interested people you also get a lot of people that just want to get advice on their lsat situation mm -hmm. and then kind of bounce yeah. Um, or at least through my advertising methods, I would get a lot of that. So now I charge a $25 deposit that they can then use towards anything if they want oh. to, but that cuts people out. Cause now someone who just wants to like waste my time, they're not going to pay that $25. Which, right. Cause they won't say it again. Yeah. And I do. And I know that I also do lose the chance to like talk to people and convince some people that they would benefit from stuff. But just as a quality of life thing, I used to do like 10 consultations a mm. week. And it was just such a headache because yeah. I, I, I'm not much of a sales guy. Like I'm kind of like, here's what I provide. If you want it, go for it. I'm fine either way, which is really bad for my business. It's just who I am. Like, I'm not going to force anything on someone. Um, but it's like, if I'm going to do free consultations, I have to like be converting on them. And I just wasn't. So I'm like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm like, right. talk, but yeah, I've been like, finding my own balance with the same. Yeah. It, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it is super different. And I, uh, I'm grateful for my 10 years of blueprint where I never had to worry about a thing outside of uh, just delivering the, the material. You know, and mm -hmm. um, everything was covered in terms of the software and the sales and everything and the attendance logs and things like that, uh, the licensing and stuff. So, uh, yeah. yeah, this has been very eye opening. Yeah, well, I have um, a few, I think a few books that I think would really help just in terms of like they look super scummy. I'll, I'll send them to you after the fact, but the, the principles in them have really Good. helped. Um, I would I would love that because it's yeah. from an internet guy who looks super scammy. You're like, there's no way this guy has legit stuff, but uh -huh. and it works. And it's like it's been useful. It looks so dumb. I hate it, but yeah. like you can't deny results. So mm -hmm. um yeah, it's uh yeah, I guess um we've gone a good while. Um we'll come, probably wrap it up soon. But this is good. I think I mean I had this whole list and we barely got to it just because there was so much kind of I mean, part of someone who's like an expert on topics is it just kind of naturally goes in directions. Um, so I guess just to kind of wrap it up with one final thing, do you have any other hot takes on the LSAT industry or just applying to law school more broadly? Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff I think we could go for. Um, accommodations currently oh, is, sure, yeah. is, is perhaps one. And I think that that's become. I'm part of the problem. I tell everyone to get them um, if they want to. I say you can all get them. It's super easy if you want to go for it. I think that so there's an element. Yeah, if we're gonna talk, if we're gonna talk a little bit about this, yeah, um, for better or for worse, and I think it's probably a little bit of both. Um, LSAC was getting bombarded with lawsuits, so that so the ADA, yeah, yeah. Americans with Disabilities Act, is, is a fascinating piece of legislation. It's actually through the the H. W. Bush administration, and it is no limits 
uh, in entitlement for people with disabilities to have um, access to all the same things that able-bodied people are, which is a beautiful concept. But course, yeah. there is no enforcement mechanism at all. There's no agency that's responsible for overseeing that. The only enforcement mechanism is the courts. It's all lawsuits. And there is no, like, um, you know, there's no in a national park. Um, we should try to do the best we can to make this accessible. In theory, it, it's very much the case that there needs to be an accessible way to do angels landing in a wheelchair, for example. Um, again, a beautiful concept, but it's some logistical nightmares. I think we can all agree. And so I think the LSAC, through the eight, through largely through ADA lawsuits, was just getting so bombarded about what used to be a very strict accommodations regime, where if you could not prove that you had accommodations all throughout college for all of your tests, it was a non-starter. You had no chance of getting it for the LSAT. Right. They got hit with all these lawsuits. And it reminds me a little bit of, um, loosely, of uh, Daniel Snyder, for the, uh, who at the time owned the Washington Redskins and was getting nailed for the name. And he just threw up his hands and he was like, fuck you guys. I'll just call it the football team. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm just done. And I feel like the LSAC has done something a little bit different. You guys all want to critique my accommodations. Fuck y'all. I'll just give it to everybody. Is that what you want yeah. kind of thing? And I think I've never seen a student get declined. Um, I, that's funny. I've seen one get declined and it's because they filled out the statement of need from a professional, which I tell people either a doctor or a therapist works. They wrote uh -huh. it themselves and they were the professional. I'm like, and then she went in, she got, I was like, that's not going to work. She went to a therapist, got a diagnosis of anxiety, which anyone can get because who's not anxious about the LSAT. And then a week later, she had accommodations. Um, wow. But that's the only time, and I've probably seen, dozens if not hundreds of people get accommodated because i just tell everyone if you want them they're out there all you have to do is ask mm -hmm. uh, which like i don't know i i always tell people like there's moral or ethical judgments on, like do you need them but also like the system is if you want them you can get them i feel like my job is just communicate that to folks and that's what that's that's what i tell my clients as well is write a response that explains any challenges you have with anxiety or focus on the test and the LSA and, and be honest, but compelling. And the mm -hmm. LSAC will make the determination as to whether that is the type of thing they want to provide accommodations for. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it's really that simple. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I think that uh, it's something that most students should consider. And maybe if you're in a position where um, you experience kind of no anxiety and no focus issues on the test, then it's, then it is not for you. And you certainly should not write a, oh, request, yeah. a request that fibs about it. But um, if if it's causing you to struggle, then write, tell the LSAC about it and see what they'd like to do. So, yeah, that's my that's my thinking on accommodations. Yeah, it's, it's very, also very time. it's a yeah, it's a really I mean, we could probably go for like an hour just on accommodations, but it becomes a tricky thing because like I know there's tutors that have accommodations and a 99th percentile score with accommodations is not the same as a 99th percentile score without like just reading comp is um I found it to be the hardest to do in time especially when i took a test i was going right up to the wire now yeah. having done thousands of hours of all that since then it's a lot easier but for me it's the one that took the most time to like really perfect so mm -hmm. i don't know because part of me was like should you be teaching or tutoring like i don't want to be like gatekeeping but occasionally you see someone with the 165 and it's like do you really understand this test to the level where you can communicate it to people um, I've, se I've seen a couple of those type of posts on reddit and things and i, I do think uh yeah teaching is such a it's, it's such a delicate balance because um, you know, yeah. we talked about the making a fishing pole versus like being a skilled fly fisherman. It's a little bit like that here too, where you got to master oh, sure. the test and then master communicating the test, but you got to do both. And I think, yes, yeah, so I, I don't know if a 165 type of score really reflects that you have mastered the test. I think it would be I, I, like, I would say maybe another hot take is I, I would think it's generally a little bit odd to take instruction from someone who didn't achieve the score that you want to achieve yeah i totally um, agree um maybe if they had years and years and years that were that way i have one other point of contention that i would like to discuss yeah definitely you uh if i recall correctly uh are a read the question before the Ooh, question still no guy right i'm very much so a um argument and then the question and I, so i might like, maybe take the other side of that I think so. Yeah. I So here's my take. I don't think I understand sure. the case. Yeah, let's hear so I would love to turn it over to you. Well, what I would say is I would understand if the test didn't include like must be trues and soft must be trues and roll questions, uh, then I'm completely on board. But it does. So I don't understand. And what are right. your 
Yeah. So my, what I tell people is we're always approaching LR questions in a weekend mindset where our default perception is to attack the argument. Yeah. And then if there's nothing to attack. You need to notice that. Um, cause it'll often be a, must be true. A most strongly supported, maybe a paradox from time to time. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I will tell people if it's a paradox and you didn't see the paradox, that's a problem. Yeah. Like, <laughs> seeing it coming because those uh, are sneakily flaws too i feel like the flaw that's endemic to any resolve or paradox question is like right. they failed the, the conclusion something. right the conclusion yeah. that this is paradoxical these are mutually exclusive that is the implicit flaw yeah point. so i'd say my main reason for it is i find folks often get tunnel vision mm-hmm. um and mm-hmm. this is another thing where i think reasonable minds can disagree i think high scores can probably compartmentalize because i often find myself seeing the question type before i can read the argument in class just as a um Right. Like I'm looking at kind of thing uh-huh. and I I'm waiting for them to do it, which takes them longer than it takes me. So like, I'll just see it before I even read because I'll just try to read it authentically the first time. I don't look at the argument before I read it so they can see what I'm actually doing. Right. And what I find is on certain question types, people are so focused in on what they're trying to answer that they miss what's right in front of them. Like mm-hmm. it'll be a question for like strength and question. And the o- argument is obviously broken and the strengthener is fixing that problem. But mm-hmm. because they're so focused on looking at strength in it, they miss that they... <laughs> like some flaw where we like sampled one person and then made a claim about a whole neighborhood. So I find that it causes people to miss the forest for the trees. Totally. I won't say that's universal because I think, um, you know, some people can probably compartmentalize that in a way that allows them to go through it properly. Um, but there is a decent amount of that. And then also, I just don't, I mean, you probably agree on this, but I just don't think the LSAT's that hard. And like, I just don't think we need tricks for it. It's just one of the, not, not say it's a trick. I think it's a strategy. I'm not denigrating it because, you know, reasonable minds um but it is one of those like it's not an indicator word like when people say therefore in the case conclusions i'm like usually not yeah. always can yeah. be exception to that and that's where you want to get really careful um so i want to clarify that i don't view this strategy at the same point as that though i do disagree with it because people get tunnel vision yeah. and they miss what's right in front of them that being said if you can avoid that and it really helps to identify conclusions that's awesome i i'm guessing if you had to do it my way you would still do just fine on the lsat there would be absolutely no problem yeah. Um, and vice versa. I think what would just uh, what would drive me nuts experientially is just like looking through a stimulus, and every now and again, kind of rarely, you'll have like a soft must be true that is that does have a complete argument. Often it's just a set of facts, typically just a set of facts, but sometimes it'll yeah. have like a thus. And I'll take a moment and start analyzing that, and then I'll be like, oh, it's a soft must be true. Now I need to kind of like shift my thinking on it. Whereas if I'd known it was a soft must be true, I'd be looking for like strong claims that I can build an inference off of expecting probably not to diagram. Same if I saw it must be true. And I think I just always think what would aggravate me the most is roles, which are not common by any means. So that's a very- sure. They're, they're very in there though, like one a section or maybe two. Right. Yeah. One a section kind of thing. And I just like to read it, kind of analyze the argument, maybe not notice the flaw because a lot of role questions have like relatively cogent argumentation. Maybe I spend a little time on the, fl- like looking for the flaw. I don't really find it. I'm like, oh, it's role question. I need to go back to this. That they're asking about the second sentence. What was the- organization there so that's what always gets me but i think like i think uh uh l has the clear method right like the clir and i think that addresses exactly my uh point here and she's with you she says read the stimulus first but she says that i think there's conclusion questions i believe is the c and the l is the loophole questions which are all the flaw and flaw derivative questions and then i is the inference the soft must be choose i'm talking about and then r is the roles right Uh, and so, I mean, I agree with that framing. I agree yeah, with that it's, framing. It's an interesting one. Cause like one of the things I have, I take run on since I've done LSAT is I started when I was 21 and it was kind of my way or the highway on a lot of things mm-hmm. where like, if I disagree with someone, it's just like, you're wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, I think th- there's still bad things in the LSAT space and there's plenty. We won't go down that rabbit hole because it'll take us another hour. Um, Cause like the one that gets me is indicator words or like, here's everything you need to know that indicates a tone. And I'm yes. like, or you can just be a critical reader. And if the yes. author gets- opinion you see it like you don't need to map like this dude posts on instagram must have been 400 words mm-hmm. i'm like yeah endorse does indicate that we are endorsing the person we're talking about however do you know english do you know that word like you're yeah. fine you don't have to memorize this um i think that's a really good but, point as uh, i always students always want the key they want like yeah. and i think something that that is often lost uh on students i'm about to talk a, bunch, a lot about fishing and hunting i don't do a lot of that <laughs> i wish but uh, yeah. I think it's a little bit like hunting where pe- where someone might come to you and they're like, oh, so like the deer are always down by the water source. And the answer is no. Yeah. Often. So, but, yeah. Uh, How often not- you get a student that says only, yeah. does that make yeah. this answer wrong? I'm like, in this context, it does. But yeah. 
universally no like only can be a totally valid answer it depends like the one that gets me the most is on people say for lr do you always want strong answer choice I'm like it's like, completely like it depends on the question um sometimes yes sometimes no necessary mm -hmm. assumption strong is bad strengthener mm -hmm. awesome and for whatever reason people have a really hard time with that um but yeah th there's a lot of stuff i mean the thing i find myself teaching probably more than anything is how to even identify a conclusion, which I just always found to be a very straightforward concept, which is like, what is the argument even saying? But a lot of people struggle because they'll just automatically go to that last sentence or they'll go to like, but before something. And it's like, well, it's like, how does it fit together? Is this supporting something or is it the support? And I don't know. I, I guess it's something I never had to learn because to me, it was just intuitive, but that's part of like teaching is when someone's at 135, it's a very different battle from, um, like I started at a 151 and I took the whole test in 50 minutes. I just like cranked through it. So like it was a pretty easy path to improvement, but, yeah. um, but I think I've gotten, I mean, I, I have a whole like method. I'm not going to go into it. Like, you know how to identify a conclusion. You don't, know, there's no need. Um, you've been but, teaching now for how long? Uh, like doing the LSAT. Yeah. Teaching. So I started, I'd say doing like maybe 10 hours a week, so like very part-time when I was a senior in college, so that would have been 2021. I started in May. Yeah. And then I graduated um, the following May in 2022, and I've been doing it full time since then. So, You're a veteran. Yeah, yeah. At this point, um, and there was actually a lot of like, I, I'm not gonna say imposter syndrome because um, I'm not gonna go with that, but like, there's a lot of I think difficulty in being mm -hmm. 21, 22, mm -hmm. and talking to people. I think there was like, a, you know, a natural and I think probably justified skepticism of like, what does this kid know? He's 22. Right. Um, but I found that even between now, because I don't feel much older. I'm only 24 now, but no one really questions me anymore for my age, which is kind of interesting because I still feel very young in the space, even though it's a very small shift. I could see it really flipping. I uh, I was young too, starting off right after uh, taking the test myself. And I think I was so lucky to um, do it for like an established prep test company and in a classroom setting, because it was just like, you're standing at the front, you're, we're seated here. It just like lends itself yeah. to those kind of like people who trust you a little bit. <clears throat> but I was 20 and... Uh, and had um two students who like halfway through the course you know week seven or something come up to me during the break and are like we know how old you are and i was like <laughs> like very serious face do not share that with the class let's please keep that between us like this is gonna make yeah. me <laughs> lose control of the course if you find out i'm 20 and the youngest other person out here is 20 as well um and every now and again, you're working with folks, uh, you know, making a career change in the middle of their oh, life. Oh, for sure. 40, 45. Yeah, They're my I, favorite my, clients, by the way. In my March Crazy. class, I think I have two or three people over the age of like 35. Like, it's really not, I mean, I had someone who was 60 last February, which I, I always tell them, I'm like, hey, like, don't go into debt for this. Um, If you're going to go and like, you're interested in a future and like learning about the law or you just want to like right. do stuff, that's fine. Please don't pay 200K for your local mm -hmm. school, which is where the LSAT can really help you because you can dodge. So like, like we were talking about earlier, the ROI on LSAT the and doing this properly in terms of, I mean, I think my, what I think is a conservative estimate is one LSAT point is $10,000. And I think that's way conservative. Um, in terms of like lifetime earnings? Um, in terms of just scholarship money too. Oh, uh, scholarship money. I see. I see. Yeah. And, and then uh, like, yeah I think that's a good. Extra yeah. calculation because if you go yeah. to like Michigan versus, I don't know, Wayne State, your lifetime earnings are going to be entirely disconnected. Um, yeah. yeah, I guess. We, we did go for a long time. This was fun. I think, I, I don't know what the deal is. I'll plug you. Hopefully um, that works out. The podcast, we're getting there. Um, it's bigger, still still small in the LSAT space, but it's growing. So hopefully it continues to get there. I like it. I'll plug everything. If you ever want to do this again, it was a good time. And there's so much to discuss that we could. Um, I'm yeah. game anytime. Yeah, maybe after um, the test has undergone some of those changes, maybe after we've started to see some of the August and September and some of the new, the hot yeah. around, around that, that could be a good time. Yeah, we kind of revisit it. Um, but yeah.